have had over the course of this tournament. But kicking things off, 24, Halls of Valor, Salute, Nagura, let's go. Hi, Nagura. You still not Jack? Nope. <laughs> no, you are not. Both teams are going to get started here off the bat, expecting to see an all 10 mob pull here prior to him to all the first boss. Now, Dangerous here is really just, of course, we're not in the necrotic affix. We are in the explosive and volcanic affix. affix. Those will be fixed in just a bit for you. So the real danger here comes with babysitting those explosives, as we said, especially when you do these large trash bowls. There's already so much to interrupt and look out for that it's easy to get lost and have some bad spawns with some of those orbs. Yeah, uh, explosive definitely one of the more difficult affixes to deal with, especially because some classes are just not very good at killing them at all, or they did too many globals to, w to deal with them. And especially in those very, very big pools, as you said, uh, Skyline D probably has a little bit of a disadvantage because they have those three melees, so if the explosives don't spawn uh, close to them, then they have a hard time killing them, and the rest of it also not as good as killing explosive than uh, Holy Paladin is. Wait, you know no problem for Skyline D <laughs> though here in Nagur, as they down, they destroy that trash right now, 18% on the board for them, getting ready to pull him all. A bit of trouble here for Method Pogchamp, dealing with that dragon, they just didn't get enough cleave off of it, and it started kind of chasing Sebs into the corner where he LOS line of sight of the rest of the mobs. So they're spending a bit of extra time dealing with it. Skyline D has now pulled him all the first boss and popped their bloodlust. Okay, so we saw the Horn of Valor coming in, uh, everyone dropping really, really low, but they calculated the damage exactly, and we saw uh, Maple just surviving with 5% HP, but uh, nothing happened so far. Of course, they did uh, pop their bloodlust, and we just see insane amount of damage coming out of this squad here. They probably just want to brute force everything, just going in, stunning everything, and just destroying the trash bags, and the, the single target damage as well is just uh, crazy for them. Killing things before they kill you is indeed an excellent strategy for these teams. Skyline D smacking as much damage as they can onto Himdall, making sure they dodge those whirlwinds, those tornadoes that come out of the dragon's breast, as we see a nice view of that here on Method Pogchamp side on the left side. Those deal an extremely large amount of nature damage should you come in contact with them. And of course, you do ha constantly have to leapfrog between these three lanes, making sure that you're not in the direct breath itself. Epo does go down on Skyline D. They will be using that battle res, and Mayu goes down as well from the dragon breath that we were just talking about. They only have one battle res available to them, and if they want to stick the rest of this fight out, they're going to have to get that healer up. It's just too much damage to heal through that horn. They actually chose to rest the, the monk, but I'm not sure if they choose to... Okay, so now they're resting the healer instead. Their healer is probably going to take... They probably just got... Okay, now they have a full team wipe coming in here, so they have to probably uh, just full wipe because they only have one battle rest available to them. Uh, it's going to take them too long if they have to finish the rest of the fight with only two DPS. Even if Maple would take the rest and they don't need the healer, it will still just take them too long. Yeah, no, it's just not worth it at this point. Even with the fact that Himdal does not actually get need to get to 0% to die, he finishes at 10%. This is absolutely devastating for Skyline D, and certainly not the team we're used to seeing out of them in terms of quality and cleanliness of kill. Method Pogchamp, it's their match to lose from this point on as they are finishing up with Himdal. 25% left before he uh, finishes the fight at that 10% phase. Yeah, so if, uh, I'm not sure what Maple died to, but uh, the rest of it just right after he died, died to the breath, as you said, probably got distracted by uh, one of his teammates dying, tried to battle rest or was talking on team sick. Maybe the call didn't go through where the dragon is coming next, uh, next and then they just had a full team. Of course, they also lose their bloodlust and lose their cooldowns. So not only is it the uh, five deaths, but it's also a lot of time lost there. But while well, Method Pop Jump is already on 20%, so only 10% left to go. Evil dipping solo there again, sub 10% for that first turn, no does. So we'll have to keep an eye on if they're successful this time around. Himdol now at 14% for Method Pogchamp on the left side of the screen. Finishing up the encounter in just a moment after which they're going to wait, seeing how the pad is for the Sentinel here. It looks like it will be favorable in a moment as they're waiting for it to get out of the way onto the left side. They will pull that two champion pack along with the healer, the mender, and pull it up to the remaining six mobs of trash. Pretty difficult pull coming in here, especially because of the orbs and all the dangerous casts going on from the two healers. Yeah, so they choose, uh, of course, to not pull the Sentinel. The Sentinel has an aura around it, making mobs immune to interrupts. So they choose not to pull it. Also has uh, more HP, of course, than all the other mobs. But this uh, pull especially, pretty difficult. You need to coordinate your stance, your AoE uh, stance, your AoE silences and so on properly to not get any cast through. Of course, there's also mystics that are doing a heal. And we have the Thunder Callers who are doing a lightning bolt at a random target that does quite a, uh, quite a lot of damage if it goes through. And that's uh, all she wrote for that trash pack as they absolutely erase everything on the board. Muscle Brought and Dr. J doing immense amounts of AoE damage. Else getting ready to help with some of the pulls here for Sevs as they pull the Sentinel that was patrolling behind them with the other Sentinel. Not too much to worry about when you have two Sentinels or three Sentinels combined outside of the damage output. There's nothing to interrupt on them. And of course, we also have Dr. J here who can spell steal their shield at 30%. Just saving a bit of time so you don't have to chew through that extra absorb.
Yeah, but only pulling two Sentinels uh, uh, without any other trash actually takes quite a long time as they have so much HP. So some other teams choose to pull Sentinels with other packs and just trying to use the Blood Elf Silence to interrupt anyway because that one actually goes through the uh, interrupt immunity from the Sentinels or Typhoons and stuff like that work as well. But uh, Team Pakchamp here try, uh, going the same way, just pulling those two Sentinels, even though as we can see it takes quite a uh, while to kill them, it's just a safer pull overall. We do see those spell seals coming out of Dr. J. He does that barrier around him now. All the teams move, or all the players moving out of those charge poles. Want to make sure you don't get too much damage from those. I think they're maybe perhaps waiting for some of their AOE CDs to come up with that two sentinel pull, which is a bit slower. Now, I wouldn't be shocked to see a pretty substantial pull here from the hallway as they're setting up that warlock gate, likely for the big pull and for Sebs to be able to get aggro and get out of range of some of those caster mobs. We actually see an interesting pull here as Seps went to the right side, pulled all the hallway from the right, while Dr. J got buffed from the Holy Paladin, used his Kaiser potion and pulled everything from the left side. So I'm pretty sure they pulled the whole hallway, pulling all those mobs together. Now they need to be very careful with those explosives coming up, but as we see the mass group coming in, the stun coming in, and now Seps is just kiting while Shelley is slowing them up. Yeah, so a fair bit of damage coming from those explosives. We have already seen, I believe, that the Lay on Hands was used on Dr. J and Elsa's used his own bubble that double forbearance debuff on those two players has now dissipated so they don't have those emergency tools left anymore but by now the mobs are dead because of the immense amount of damage coming out of the wind walker and the fire mage so well played by them there the orbs did leak just a bit but they were prepared for that and perhaps it was part of their game plan that hey you know what some of these orbs might go off with the amount of mobs we're pulling off we just have to focus on surviving here skyline d has finally finished off him doll and they too have done that larger pull up the stairs with the first mystics so you can see Method Pogtum now on 72% trash, so they pulled the whole hallway, got so much trash percentages, and now they're onto their way to Fenrir, and they dealt pretty well with the explosives. Of course, some of them went through, but as, as long as there's only one or two going through, then it's you can just use your defensives and you can survive it, or you can even outrange it, outrange it if you want to. But yeah, Dr. J, I talked to him a lot, and he said explosive is just his favorite affix because he's so good at dealing with those explosives as a fire mage. So they do go over to Fenrir's side. Pretty common for teams in this tournament uh, that they do that. And well, it, then again, in the last series, we did see them go to Herja. So it could go either way. But they, the plan here is that they will deal with Fenrir first. And by the time they get over to Herja on the left side, the third boss, the way they're planning to choose it, they will have that bloodlust available to them. Skyline D working on some of the hallway trash in one of the Sentinels that we saw earlier. A bit slower even, too, because they're only working on one Sentinel, whereas we saw at least uh, two pulled by Mythic Podchamp there. Okay, so we see Method Pakchamp on Fenrir first phase here. They also pulled one of the trash packs to the boss, as we've seen, uh, was it Free Marcy do it earlier and actually had a full team wipe there going on, which I believe they pulled one of the uh, bulls, which probably was a mistake because those are actually really, really scary for melee players. So this time around, they only pulled a trash pack without the bull and everything seems to run smooth for them so far. Yeah, the bull AOE stomp is absolutely devastating, so no danger here for them. Now, Fenrir is in a two-phase encounter. It will enter its second phase at 60%. He'll kind of run off licking his wounds and the rest of the players will have time to do a bit of damage to some of the trash coming up before they re-engage Fenrir at 60% and he resumes most of his phase one abilities and a couple of new extra phase two abilities. Skyline D has pulled some more of the hallway, dealing with some more of that trash right now, but they have a fair bit to go. I mean, they're only at 47% trash versus Method 75%, who's already working on their second boss. Yeah, Skyline D's uh, trash pulls here in this hallway were significantly smaller, and I, I could also see how they're struggling with those explosives as the tank had to kite the mobs, and uh, the melees just had to stay back, killing the explosives, pretty much walking out of melee range to deal with the explosives because there's just no range player. And uh, as I said, a Rassadur is just slightly worse at killing them uh, compared to a holy paladin so they're struggling a lot with those trash balls and uh, the entire method pogchamp team of course walking on water there getting over to fenrir second area for their pool now keep in mind for those at home they do have still a bit trash a bit of trash left in the herja area and they only need to get to around 84 point something percent in order to be essentially done by the time they reach the four kings upstairs uh, before skull vault so they don't have too much trash left which is why they opted to skip most of the dog packs here needing to only engage one of those hounds before getting back on fenrir's phase two yeah, so Fenrir phase two, uh, he spawns those uh, Vorgans whenever he does an unholing blast or whatever, unholing howl something, whatever it's called. There is a There's howl. <laughs> it's a howl. Okay, so he interrupts and he also spawns those Vorgans, as we can see. He also has a send of blood where he fixates one player, as we can see Dr. J being fixated. You usually just need to kite them up. Unless you're a druid, you can just go and bear from attacking the sun. But uh, 
uh, needs the ability to deal with for those players, of course. We also have the leap ability where uh, that we can see right now all four players being targeted except the tank. The Fenrir is just jumping around to all those players. They, of course, try to dodge the ability because if you get hit by the leap, it leaves a bleed behind. It just stacks up and does quite a bit of damage. But we saw all four players actually manage to dodge uh, as they don't have a debuff on them. Fenrir down to 35%. This pull is quite doggone for now. Skyline D still working on some of the trash. They have moved over opposite of what we were saying for Method Pogchamp over to the kind of Herja wing here. They will have their Bloodlust available by the time they hit Herja, but because part of that is because they had the wipe on Himdol in the first place that set them so far back. So they will engage with Herja, have that Bloodlust available, and then have the option to use it later on Skovald or um, uh, Final Boss Room. For some reason, I'm forgetting his name right Odin. now. Odin, thank you. Uh, so we'll have to see which one they choose to use it on, but for now, they will have to deal with Herja first. Bloodlust coming back up soon for Pogchamp. Of course, they will not use it here, though. They will be saving it for Herja as well. Yeah, 40 seconds left for Team Pokchan. Of course, they still need to do the trash before Hersh, and they need to do those two mini bosses. So they will have a little bit of downtime where they're not going to use this Bloodlust. But overall, you're just going to get three Bloodlusts, I believe, in this uh, dungeon anyway. So they can choose if they want to use on Odin, uh, the last one, or on Skovald, after, of course, using it on Hersh. Fenrir leaping around right now. The player's doing well to space out as every player he does hit with this leap will get a bleed stack applied to them, including any player near their uh, primary target. So you don't want to make you want to make sure you don't get too many of those bleed stacks applied to the players. Method Pachamp now downing Fenrir, getting that water walking up on the team with Path of Frost from the Blood Deacon, getting ready to move back all the way over to Herja's Hall, which is where Skyline D is right now, finishing up these two mini bosses worth of trash and waiting for Herja to spawn in just a moment. Yeah, so Herja about to spawn. Of course, Herja, one of the, if not the most difficult boss in this uh, instance to deal with on Tyrannical. Uh, they do have their Bloodlust ready. They also have two battle resses, but uh, they have some squishy classes in their lineup, especially the Monk, of course. Uh, but Demon Hunter and Rogue should be able to survive. Also, a Druid has this bear for him to just deal with those Arcing Balls and those Expel Lights. Uh, usually, you also have Blood Decay very good because they have the lead for the Eye of the Storm, which is the big AoE that happens on the Lightning side uh, whenever uh, Herja is there. And as we can see, it popping the lead right now, the, the rest of the are just healing up the group. And of course, Demon Hunter has a lot of leads and uh, Rogue has that feint to deal, to deal with that ability, so they're not even dropping that much here. Yeah, not too dangerous for them, and that blood, uh, the blood, uh, the consumption rather from the blood DK will be available for every single one. Blood DK getting punted there in the correct direction, so that she can start getting empowered by the holy spells and losing some of her nature stacks. Here we will have the holy bounce, as we can see on top of the monk there, Eeple just beside their blood DK. It will bounce three times before it kind of dissipates and goes away, and we'll have the same sanctify cast as the trash as well. This one is a bit easier to dodge larger gaps, and she has a bigger hitbox. So even with the three melee comp, you are able to kind of stick to her 100% of the time and do the damage. Method Pogchamp wasted no time and have already gotten over to Herja's room, pulled the remaining trash on top of the two mini bosses while handling the explosives as well, just making sure to hide inside of that bubble to reduce the nature damage from that storm by 90%. Yeah, this is also a very interesting pull because uh, this trash back here, those shield mate, they actually do a lot of damage to the tank. But since they do have Shallow with that slow rain, uh, Saps, you can just see him uh, kite in a circle pretty much, not getting hit by those uh, shield maidens at all, only having to deal with the damage from the minibus. So it's definitely good for them to have this uh, wall up to deal with the slow and having the mage uh, killing the explosive. And just quite a lot of damage coming in for Skyline D. Two deaths go down. Immediate battle res is on them. They're now down to zero battle res as Mayu and Epil, the rest of Druid and the Windwalker, have gone down. They are able to recover. Herja's only halfway through her uh, the fight overall right now. The Rogue has also proc that cheat death. So a bit of instability coming out of the team right now. And they don't have any more mistakes to make as they don't have any battle res available to them. Method Pogchamp has finally pulled Olmir, the other second mini boss, the holy component of spawning Herja here, and will start cleaving him down on top of Solston. Yeah, sometimes, uh, as I said, this whole explosive uh, just a difficult thing for Skyland D to deal with, especially Hersha walks from one side to the other. At some uh, Sometimes she might spawn an explosive uh, while the tank get, gets knocked on the other side. So the melees follow the boss and then there's this explosive in the back that no one sees or no one knows how to deal with. And then you get that damage on top of uh, something else like an Expelite or an Arcing Bolt and it's just so much damage coming in. There's also the combo that sometimes happens and we see Maple actually dying. So they don't have 
of Valores uh, for him. The boss is on 22%, though, so they might be able to finish it. But uh, the less players you are, the more difficult Hersha actually becomes because of all those Expel Lights and Arcing uh, Bolt abilities. If there's less eligible targets, then it's more likely that you get the combo, so Expel Light and Arcing Bolt at the same time. And if you don't have a cooldown for that uh, combo, then it's very likely that you're going to die. So unfortunately, our resident Windwalker <laughs> once again <laughs> is the one that suffers the brunt of the mass amount of damage on Hersha of 24 Tyrannical. They will not be able to get him up, as you stated, but Hersha down to 13% now. I think they'll be able to pull it off. They were close enough. They just have to deal with one more nature phase and maybe the remainder of a small punt towards the uh, holy phase, but MGT getting quite a lot of damage there. The rogue on Skyline D doesn't have that cheat death to fall back on, but no problem for them as they all huddle back in the bubble. And between the four members left, they have enough survivability during this thunderstorm phase. Method Pogchamp has also now pulled Hersha 90% on the board, and they've fought their bloodlust, which is what they were kind of waiting uh, for it to come up when they went over to Fenrir's side first. Yeah, so Hersha on 4%, they should be able to finish off this boss uh, without any more deaths, as long as they uh, use their cooldowns properly when they get targeted by those abilities. And of course, Method Pogchamp uh, still having that bloodlust up, doing a lot of damage uh, on the pool here, as we see Master Brow doing uh, 3.2 million DPS, and Hersha on 70% as well. Now, l they do have two battle rests as well for Method Pogchamp, so in case they have s one or two pe uh, people dying, they can actually recover, but if, uh, if there's any more problems, just like Skyline D, then uh, it's going to be difficult. And we're getting the full screen here for Method Pogchamp already as they pop back up, getting ready to be punted over to the nature side for their second round of Thunderstorm. You know, this team does has a fair bit of survivability as well in the form. Well, actually, really just Shella, uh, the Warlock, has the survivability. The Mage is kind of a one-trick pony in terms of having only that one um, ice block available to them. So a bit more work needed for Elsrath's side uh, as opposed to Skyline Ds, but they have no problem dealing with it. And really just that Leech is such a crucial component from the Blood DK for every single storm. No problem dealing with that storm, and soon they'll be moving right back over to the Holy Side. Yeah, I can imagine yo uh, most people here using a lot of defensive legends Legendaries, maybe defensive trinkets for Alzerad as well, maybe using that uh, Fell Shield emitter, especially for this Arcing Bolt that is coming out after that Eye of the Storm, where everyone is pretty low still from that AoE damage. Uh, you usually want to use one of those defensive trinkets as a, a healer on that person gets the Arcing Bolt, or uh, and you want to save that sacrifice usually for the combo, the Arcing Bolt and the Expel Light in case one of them gets it, or if someone just gets a lot of abilities in a row on them and they're just running out of defensive cooldowns, for example. And oh man, Herja just has so much health. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. Back and forth we go, just like a <laughs> ping pong match. Right back over to the nature side, muscle bra, uh, muscle bra dripping. Dripping. Well, maybe he's dripping from <laughs> the storm as well, but dipping quite low there with one of those lightning bolts hitting just as she starts her storm there. No problem for the team to handle again with this storm. I mean, dipping quite low, but it's pretty, once you get into the kind of gist of the fight there's no problem dealing with it as long as you have the defensives to deal with it you do reach a peak of damage on the nature and on the holy side and as long as you're able to kind of deal with the cap damage every time you should be able to down her it's a pretty long fight and it's a tough one at that yeah, it's uh, one interesting thing to note here in this boss fight is that the Expel Light uh, always targets the, the person with the most HP first. So that's why we see Alcerad, of course, as a Holy Paladin, you have a lot of HP. So he always, he always gets the first Expel Light and the person with the second most HP, which is usually Shella, gets the second Expel Light and so on. So if you have something that can increase your HP, you can even bait an Expel Light on you if that's uh, what you choose. Yep, so no problem for them. They finally down Herja and have all of their trash percent, as we said earlier, available to them so they don't need to pull any extra trash before moving upstairs to the Four Kings, which is their, what they're kind of sprinting and priming to do right now. We see that that perg is not available for Sebs as he... Um, I, he did Invispot, if I'm not, yeah, obviously Invispot. It Invispots right past those two Sentinels and right up this beautiful Holy Bridge on the way to the remaining two bosses. But of course, first are the four kings. So the four kings, the four mini bosses, uh, we saw most teams having this one trick where they take the beers from the hallway. And if you throw it uh, at the exact right time, then you can actually engage two uh, of the mini bosses at the same time instead of only one at the start and two at the very end. Yeah, you do enrage them. I myself too would be quite angry if somebody threw a beer at me, Rob see that look from the side of your eye they move upstairs to the kings right now usually you pull the two side ones each of the kings has their own kind of special ability and every time one of them dies he buffs his brothers with his ability as well so by the time you get to the third and fourth kings they have several abilities from the previous king some of them including sever a huge tank hit dagger of course on the melee those ghosts that spawn on the side the images that if they reach the boss they will heal them and the last one that we actually saw a bit of a hiccup on in the last series which is that aoe cast that you want to make sure is interrupted because it deals a well 
will obviously do a tremendous amount of damage, as we saw firsthand. Yeah, we actually saw a full team wipe coming out of, I believe, Galtshotters it was earlier. Uh, they still managed to win, but it was pretty close. They almost threw because of missing this one interrupt. But here you can see just how important every single ability is in those kind of dungeons. Uh, if you feel like it's easy to, uh, it's just one ability you need to interrupt, but there's so many things that you need co uh, to coordinate. And if one person just doesn't pay attention for one second, or the shot caller makes a wrong call, then it just causes a full team wipe and it costs you so much time. Yep, so there's the yell getting interrupted on Ranulf and Haldor follows suit as well. Skull and X marked for them. They want to kind of kill one king at a time. Dealing with three at the same time does have the potential to give one of the DPS as two of those daggers could go out at the same time on the wrong target or the tank can accrue too many of those sever stacks, increasing their damage taken by 20% per stack. The Ancestors trying to kind of close in on the pack here. Ample opportunity for them to also proc some Cephas on these Ancestors on the side with various CC abilities and punts, knockbacks, what have you. Muscle Bra actually gets smacked right in the face as one of those <laughs> kings spawn. Unfortunately, Sebs was just not quick enough to pick it up, and it defaulted its first melee swing to Muscle Bra's face, who did suffer the consequences. But love, fortunately, they do have enough battle reses available and get him right back up. Yeah, they still have two battle reses here. Of course, uh uh, on the last boss on Odin, you can't actually use your battle reses anymore. So using the battle reses here, even for the mini bosses here, and using the rest of your reses for Skavald is totally fine as you don't need them or you can't really use them for Odin. And we have Skyland D back on the screen as well. They're on Fenrir now in the second phase on 35%. It seems like uh, they're doing fine so far. Their Bloodlust is actually going to be back up. It's going to be interesting to see if they use it for Fenrir or if they just choose to save it for Skavald later on. I, I think they'll probably save it for Skavald. They still have a minute left on it. Fenrir is now at 30% but Skyline D still looking to make Fenrir go the way of Old Yeller. Method Pogchamp over there on the main screen, finishing off the last two of the Kings, after which they'll incur what is a quite fairly long RP phase, while uh, Skovald comes out quite angry that he is not the selected champion of Odin and will fight you for the Aegis in the middle. Fenrir down now to 20% for Skyline D. Uh, they still have to get all the way upstairs, deal with the four Kings, and then finally get to this RP that we're talking about for Method. So, I mean... The method needs probably two wipes here in order for Skyline D to be able to catch up. Yeah, they're very far behind at this point. It needs a miracle for them to catch up to Method Pogchamp here. As we see, the God King Skovald RP, as you said, that takes quite a long time, but the, the boss itself, when it actually engages, uh, does uh, quite a few uh, difficult abilities that uh, most of the people have to deal with. One of them is this uh, Fellblaze charge, where it targets uh, one random player. It can also be the tank, uh, and it charges to that player's position. So usually, once you avoid it, because it does quite a lot of damage, especially on the plus 24 Tyrannical, but uh, most of the classes that they have here in Meta Pogchamp probably do have an easy time dodging it. As we have a mage, you can just blink out of it. We have Shella, who does have the, the portal or the gateway to dodge it. And we also have Masselba, who just can uh, use his illusion. Or, or he can just, you know, eat it to the face and die and then get res. <laughs> most monks do <laughs> these one. maps. Uh, but well blinked there by Dr. J to indeed dodge that first charge. Immediately the shield goes down to deal with the Ragnarok cast coming from Skovald. After this, though, he will be the one to grab the shield from you and cast his own kind of hellblaze amongst the group with, that will spawn three fire elementals. Now, these spawn on players, which is why you're seeing the players kind of stand near the boss so that you can bait all three spawns while still effectively and efficiently cleaving the boss and killing them those flames of woe. He saw Shale moving out a little bit early there before all the flames spawn, just because uh, sometimes uh, Skovald does a foul blazing charge right after this shield phase. So you need to make sure that you're very far away as uh, one of those players that needs to use the, that blink ability or the teleport ability, because if you're very close in melee range, then it's very difficult to dodge. I was just pointing at the bottom of the screen. I was like, oh, I hope that explosive orb doesn't <laughs> go off. But the explosive orb does go off at the same time as one of the charges and the Windwalker died, I told you. The Windwalker does go down and they use the battle rest. Shale goes down as well from the charge, I think, yes. which is surprising to see a Warlock die, so, uh, I mean, just one shot from that. Ragnarok goes up again. They have gotten the Aegis and will be using it here to stay safe. No battle res is left, but as you said on uh, Odin, there is no battle res available to you anyways, because if you die, you actually get carried up to the balcony on that fight. Immediate Fellblaze charge. Well done to pull the trick off by them. You want to pop this Aegis as late as possible once the Ragnarok starts. That way, his next special ability after his Ragnarok, usually a Fellblaze charge, actually gets eaten by the shield too, so it's kind of a freebie for the team. Yeah, so one uh, difficult thing here to deal with for the Warlock is that his his port needs to be placed beforehand, and if it's placed in, if one paddle spawns on top of the portal, it's actually uh, annoying, because if you use your portal, you actually get immediately get the tick from the pool on the ground, and it does a lot of damage, it might just, two ticks might just kill you, but uh, I wonder why I didn't pull up a gateway preemptively, because the gateway is just the second safe way to use in case there's a paddle on top of your uh, portal. 
I mean, maybe he just thought he could eat the damage. I don't know. Maybe he just miscalculated there. Muscle Bra getting a fair bit low there again, but they do manage to heal him up. The last Flame of Woe gets killed. Savage Blade well dealt with by Sebs there, making sure he has his active mitigation available to him so that he doesn't incur that extra 20-second bleed. Ragnarok going out again from the boss. Shield popped well laid here. Should be eating the charge if there is one, as we can see the team safely avoids that charge. And once again, Skovald will be grabbing the shield and using it against the team. Yeah, we see their blood loss actually coming up in 10 seconds. I would believe they want to save it for the last boss at this point because uh, Skovald is already so low and I assume none of the players have their cooldowns ready at the moment or want to save it for that extra damage phase on Odin later on. But uh, it should be easy for them to finish off the boss here, even though they don't have any battle rests, so they can't make any more mistakes with those uh, foul blaze rushes. And fortunately, that Fellblaze Rush actually does target Sebs, the tank there. So he's the only one that eats the damage. No problem for a Blood DK to deal with. Chela there is the one targeted. You can see he well ported that time, making sure to avoid that potential one shot that hit him earlier. Skull Vault now down to 4%. Should be no problem for the team to just clean this up in a moment and start the RP for Odin, who will dominantly jump down into the arena, getting ready to face the players in their final test. So Alzerat here was uh, didn't want to deal with Skovald anymore and just used his bubble on that last Fellblaze Rush just to be safe as there is uh, going to be a pretty long RP again uh, once Odin jumps down until he can be engaged and then the boss actually dies at 80% uh, has a lot of HP so every percentage is actually quite a bit of HP it looks like it's just very little but it's actually quite a bit as we see Skyline D back on the screen they are uh, on the mini buses, so they're on their way to Skovald as well. I think that was the last one by the looks of it. Yeah, so they're just starting to spawn Skovald, the fight that we just saw Method Pog Champ kill. And I mean, a tyrannical 24 of Skovald, as we saw with Herja, takes a while. I mean, that was yeah. a two minute fight, something like that. So it's going to be a bit before Skyline D catches up. They're just praying for a wipe for Method Pog Champ. And at this point, if you're going to wipe on Odin, it doesn't really matter if you have the battle reses or not, as we mentioned. Odin, I would say, is not nearly as dangerous as Skovald, and especially Herja, in terms of one shot mechanics. Just want to make sure you avoid the whole balls don't get hit by those and of course don't stand in his aoe which takes one year to cast so it's uh, quite simple in that regard as long as the ad is kept down locked down as well in terms of cc kills and interrupts yeah, the more spears there are in the room, the, the more damage the AOE actually does when he shatters the spears. And uh, on higher levels, on Tyrannical, it actually does quite a bit of damage. So sometimes people choose uh, to run defensive uh, legendaries. But I believe on 24, it shouldn't be a big deal just to use defensive cooldowns or defensive healing cities coming out of Elserad, maybe Aura Mastery, for example. And of course, uh, the buff is going to come out any second now, where the players get applied one rune on top of their head, where they have to walk to the rune, and they will uh, turn into uh, a Valkyrie. A Valkyrie, and they'll get a damage. <laughs> a Valkyrie in the, 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 the kind of World of Warcraft world that we live in. So the Valkyries do give you a 30 second buff for 50% increased damage done and healing done. So this is why you're seeing the Blood Lesby saved until this point, as Nagura mentioned, along with likely everyone's CDs, pots, etc., getting as much of that damage in as possible on Odin. As he does dip below his relative 50% mark, going below the 90%, no longer benefiting from that Cinedaria belt that I would assume Muscle Bra is wearing at the moment to get all that extra damage in. Yeah, of course, uh, Cinedaria only one leather wearer here, so only Muscle Bra. Who can wear that Cinedaria here? The, we can also see the at that is casting that surge that needs to be interrupted, but they're dealing with it quite well. Of course, they also have two ranged interrupts, one from Dr. J and one from Shelle. And uh, if they don't have any interrupt ready, then the Saps can just either grip it or range stun it. So they shouldn't have a problem dealing with that at, at all. And the boss is 5% left at this point. Yeah, I mean, it's just Blood Decay is just so good for dealing with that ad. That and Prop Paladins, but I don't even know what the other tanks are called anymore because <laughs> all these Blood Decays in this competition, they're just so strong. The Obliterator does go down, and Odin is now counting his last numbers. About 2.5% left on Odin, I believe exactly at 80.5%, if I'm not mistaken, is when we go over. Of course, we don't have the luxury of that decimal place there. Dr. J getting a bit of damage on him, but nothing too dangerous there. Gets healed back up from that 24% state, and Odin will be going down, allowing Method Pog Champ to claim the first map. Rob? Look, I mean, I, like I, getting ready to go head on head here in Laura Karazan. Immediate uh, kind of control undead as we see from both Blood DKs as they run up. That just one spirit is so inefficient to just DPS and cleave down alone. So the advantage of the Blood DK here amongst many others as they lead the charge up on top, uh, on top of the balcony. Yeah, also all the rest of the trash here. Not only is it pretty difficult to deal with, especially for the tanks because of this throw coin ability that does a lot of damage, but it also gives very, very little percentage. So we see 
most of the teams just keeping it as we see Elsered and Mio with the rest of them just stealthing through. First of all, triggering this event because it is quite a long RP before you can actually engage the boss fight. And then he goes back, probably mass resting the rest of the team, or if they choose to do another way, maybe just go past it another way. Yeah, so you know, we like the RP for this event is very long. It's usually a minute, something like that, depending on which one we have, which we'll have to see in a moment. Here's the mass stealth coming out of Skyline D. So they do have that advantage in the rogue, opting not to get as many deaths on the board. In fact, they pull some of the trash together using that mass stealth, get rid of it, clean it up, and then we'll continue on to the opera event without incurring any of those deaths. Method Pogchamp still working on some of that trash. Whether or not they decide to do the wipe, we'll see. I doubt they will by this point because Elsrat has already returned back to the group and is already healing as opposed to sitting in a faraway position getting ready to heal, and rightfully so, as they have already cleared what they need to clear and will be heading down to that opera area. Yeah, we actually saw Method Pogchamp do a quite big pull there. Uh, they also released the spirit and killed the spirit off, while Skyland D is uh, killing the spirit on the way to this uh, to this uh, event here. And uh, as we've seen, explo some explosives actually going off for Method Pogchamp and the whole group almost dying, everyone dropping really low. That's uh, the danger of explosive here if you pull those, three sh uh, those big trash groups together. Yeah, no problem. Ultimately for them, MG he did proc his cheat death from that spirit that they're cleaning up as the last of that RP starts. And we, of course, then we are back to the, I believe, Beauty and the Beast event here with the cauldron and all of the various kitchen appliances, which aren't actually kitchen appliances because there's brooms and all that kind of weird stuff. But here, as soon as you kill one of the mobs, everything else will heal back up to 100% health. So you want to make sure you're killing the highest priority targets. In most situations for the groups, it's Mrs. Cauldrons, as she will constantly do a lot of damage with her soup spray onto the group and does have that AoE that denies a fair bit of area denial. Uh, of course, the Oven, who I always forget his name for some reason, is completely invulnerable until you kill the first three. Coggles, there we go. Now we're and then we see, of course, Bablet here, the broom that fixates on a random player. Uh, if Bablet actually walks uh, through the fire on the floor, then it gains speed. So you don't want to cut it through the fire, and you also want to get rid of the fire with uh, one of the debuffs that gets applied to you. You just uh, walk through the fire, and you actually get rid of it. So we can see the room actually being pretty uh, clean for a method puck jump here, and we can see uh, Dr. J kiting Bablet around. Of course, they're not clean. There's a broom clean. <laughs> broom <-nicker. laughs> Method Pogchamp dealing over with Luminor now, after which Ablet will, of course, heal to full. So a lot of the damage that comes out, as long as it's buffing their single target, is efficient. But a lot of, for instance, the spread uh, ignite damage from Jay is really quite lost on this fight until we get to the Cogleston phase where he will spawn some forks. MGT dipping quite low there. Doesn't have the safety of that cheat death available to him. So they'll have to keep an eye on him and make sure they get that health up. But Skyline D having killed Mrs. Cauldrons first as well and now working on Luminor. Yeah, so we actually can see a lot of explosives spawning here in this boss fight because there's so many mobs, especially in a very poor and uh, explosives also spawn explosives themselves. So you can be a little bit unlucky with explosives. It's a little bit of an RNG affix, but we can see both teams actually dealing quite well with the explosives as well. And one thing to note is that Skyland actually did not use the Bloodless. So I wonder if they want to do a very big pull just right after this event here. Yeah, that is interesting because most teams kind of want to get that Bloodless rolling right away just to make sure they get maximum output out of it over the course of the dungeon. So as long as they're not missing the entirety of a Bloodless later in the dungeon, we'll see exactly what they have planned as they start working on Bablet, the Bru the last mob that they need before Cogleston access, which Method Pogchamp on the left side of the screen has now gotten access to. Now, Cogleston will cast uh, a debuff on the tank that makes the damage take an increase by, I believe, 75%, and also will spawn some silverware on the side, which is not very nice as it tries to stab you in the eyeballs. He will also cast a buff that increases their haste by, I think, 100%, something like that, quite a fair bit, and I believe the mage can actually spell steal that buff, if I'm not mistaken, so a nice benefit for Dr. J in this case. Yeah, and so Team Pogchamp actually quite a bit ahead at this point as they're uh, working on Cogglestone while uh, Skyland D is still working on Bablet and then have to kill Cogglestone. Of course, they're missing this Bloodlust, which is very interesting. But it will be interesting to see where they use the Bloodlust because Method Pogchamp already on seven minutes, so already three minutes of Bloodlust debuff duration is gone. So uh, as I said, if they're not losing one whole Bloodlust duration, then it might just be their tacti the tactic that they chose to do. And Seb's just kiting just a bit there. He did have three of those bleed debuffs from the silver forks that are out. There's a fair bit of them on the uh, arena right now, but nonetheless, Cogleston does die. And here we see a really huge pull typically from teams coming in as they'll often pull this backstage uh, access, which they have access to rather, all the way downstairs into the understage. Looks like they're playing it a bit safer just because of the sheer danger of explosives in this scenario. So they're only doing the backstage first and then they will move under the stage. Skyline D only at 35% now on Cogleston. Yeah, explosive is very dangerous on those big pulls and 
uh, most of the pools in Lower Karasan are very big pools because the mobs uh, don't tend to have that much HP, but there's just a lot of them. And most of the mobs are actually pretty dangerous as well, especially uh, the group that he's pulling here, Saps, right now, because uh, if one of those casts goes through, it actually means that it's a group wipe, so you need to coordinate your AoE stuns, your AoE interrupts, uh, and your Blood Elf silences properly, and you need to make sure that they actually die pretty fast, as we can see here. A lot of those orbs go off, turning some of those members into the Phantom of the Opera as they release and start to head back through the backstage, but a lot of them have gone up, so it looks like maybe Reigns will just be opting to get himself killed so that they can release and go in the direction of Morose, which is oftentimes how we see teams try to recover. Uh, perhaps it was completely planned by them in this case, we'll see, because I didn't really see an effort to actually kill those orbs. It's not like they were doing much after Coggleston died. Method Pogchamp here pulling all of these ushers right now, which you do have to turn around for for their flashlight spell, as it will deal double damage and disorient you if you do not have your back turned. Okay, so there might be an interesting strat coming out of Skyland D. As you said, they died on purpose and chose to go to Morose instead. Maybe they're saving this Bloodless because they're going to pull the Morose. I doubt they're going to pull it with the trash together because they obviously need to see. We see a lot of explosives uh -oh. coming out uh -oh. here for Skyland D. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of damage coming up as Maple does go down, unfortunately, with a lot of that residual damage from some of those orbs going out. Might have gotten hit by one of the Swirlies or a melee as well, as that was a pretty substantial pull. He does release and will be rejoining his team in just a moment. Six deaths on the board for that Method Pogchamp still clean at the zero percent, mar uh, the zero death mark, excuse me. They're doing a similarly large pull, a bit slower though. They're choosing not to pull the second half of this room, trying to kind of respect just how dangerous some of those orb spawns can be. Yeah, they chose, they chose to pull one of those uh, phantom guest groups out of the hallway outstairs, and now they're going to pull the rest of it. But yeah, Musclebra died here, of course. Both of the monks uh, died on this pool. <laughs> what a surprise. Musclebra died here, of course. <laughs> <laughs> As if we were expecting this tragedy to happen for the Windwalkers. They do start to clean up the rest of the room and making sure that these Arcane Warden Swirlies, uh, which are the more damaging ability, if I'm not mistaken, the circles that go around the players do a fair bit of damage, nothing too dangerous, but the Swirlies do a fair substantial amount of damage onto the players. Usually uh, teams choose to wait for the Bloodlust timer to come back up before they go on Morose because it is quite a difficult boss to deal with, especially on Tyrannical. Uh, but Skyland D did save their Bloodlust, so they actually choose to pull Morose right now. You can see them throwing out the CC here. Well, uh, I'm not sure if Meta Pogchamp chooses to do some trash to get their blood us uh, back up or if they choose to do Morose without their blood us ready. So they opted to see uh, to not CC Druger, who jumps and whirlwinds at one of the range targets, as we can see. It seems like they're actually trying to DPS him down first. And of course, Ferenc as well, who was the one that does that huge holy frontal. Now, that frontal cannot be interrupted by ordinary means, but you can punt it and displace him prior to him doing it and getting it off to save the uh, potential damage and devastation that it it might do the bigger problem here is that they have to make sure exactly where they're choosing to fight this boss as we can see orbs do spawn on top of the stage from the two cc members so you want to make sure that your los or line of sight from them via the stage yeah so if you stand right in front of the stage as you said then those explosives actually hit you as we saw at the very start skyland d pulled it and two explosives spawned and they actually got hit by it and almost died and then uh, the tank actually rains uh, tanked it to the left side and now their line of sight to the mobs but the uh, Elsred on the Holy Paladin compared to the rest of it here on this boss actually matters quite a bit because of this one ability that Morose says, uh, which is called Garode. Uh, we can see uh, on Method Pogchamp's side, no one has the Garode debuff on them, while on Skyland D, three people, uh, actually four people already have the debuff because Mio uh, as a Rastodor, you just do not have any immunity, and if no one on your team has the Garode debuff on you, then uh, Morose is going to cast it on the healer 100% of the time. So Elsred as a Holy Paladin can just immune the debuff off himself and then he will get another debuff thus delaying all the debuffs on the rest of his team as we can just see him immune him off yeah, right I mean, now. That's a huge advantage Nagura especially in this tyrannical setting as we mentioned the entire team is currently debuffed for Skyline D. Those hawks will only get you so far from the rest of Druid and Morose is still at 76% for Skyline D as they're kind of dealing with the last two guests. Everyone's barely hanging on right now. Miu's going to run out of mana easily at this point, or just people are going to start flopping over as the second stack, and of course these do stack, the second stack of Groat does go on Maple. Unfortunately, the Windwalker yeah. in the group at this point, not the most survivable character of some of the options that are available to the team. So we'll have to keep an eye on them, but they are trying to kind of finish off Mills. Actually, I believe they're going to ignore Millstripe and just go for the Morose kill at this point, as long as just they're interrupting her on the side, making sure none of those leak. Pogchamp already at 50% on Morose, and I believe they're ignoring two of the guests, which is why they've already pushed ahead in boss damage. Yeah, so we see uh, everything falling apart here for Skyland D as two of the members die. They have two battle rests ready, so they can get them back up. Uh, 
it, sometimes it might actually be intended to let people die because uh, the Garot debuff actually gets uh, removed. So sometimes to save healers mana, you just let someone who has two sacks die and dress them back up if you have a lot of battle resses ready, just to preserve the mana because this is a long fight. And uh, as we can see, Moreau is still on 45% for Skalandi and uh, Mio is already really low on mana here. And it's only now that Method Pog Champ is really starting to feel the brunt of those Garots. Finally, three members have them, but Moreau is already at 22% of this phase. It's really not that much danger by the time it starts to ramp out of control, much like it did for Skyline D earlier. Once again, Skyline D has the entirety of the team with the Grote debuffs. Purgatory is already procced, and Cheat Death is not available for them either, so everybody quite vulnerable on that side. Morose now dipping to 10% in just a moment here for Method Pogchamp, who didn't even use their Bloodlust on this. Yeah, without Bloodlust, they just seem to have a lot more boss damage, or maybe something went wrong with the boss damage on Skyline D's side, but they're struggling a lot. The boss is still on 21% uh, percent HP, and we can see the rest are just struggling so much with his mana, probably running out of healing cooldowns as well, as uh, they just... Uh, thankfully, they got uh, this double stack on the Demon Hunter, who has a lot of leech and can heal himself up, but uh, it's just looking very grim for them on this boss fight here. Method Pogchamp downing Morose and saddling up to move over to the stable area for Adamin, which is, uh, well, not the final, it can be the final boss of the dungeon. They, of course, still have to deal with Maiden later, so they're opting to deal with Adamin first. We typically see huge pulls come out of this room. The danger, of course, being not only the charge from these Spectral Chargers, but the massive amount of orbs that could spawn with such a large pull. So we're going to have to be careful here. Now, they do have that kind of comfort of the wall through, uh, through that doorway there where they can LOS if needed for the orbs. But this is a pretty sizable pool here in the middle of the room for the group. Yeah, we actually see Skal and D doing something interesting. So they used their shroud, walking through the kitchen, and now they're going to jump down to Ataman. And I'm not sure if they're going to pull the whole room yep, because explosive is a big problem here. As we see, someone die. Uh, he must have just not gotten far enough during the Shroud, but they will res him in a moment. It's not uncommon to see this pull. We've seen it in some of the other teams, just mass pull into the middle of the room. I don't remember if there was explosive, though, no. there. So it's going to be pretty dangerous, though. Don't pull Adamin. Adamin, of course, if you do pull him in the middle of the room, for those at home, he will automatically aggro everything in this stable area, and it's just kind of a disaster as a result because of all the orbs that are just about to go off here and perhaps kill some of the members as Mayu does go down, and a lot of these orbs are just completely unstable right now, managing to catch up barely here one more orb goes off no other deaths but they're opting not to really my rather is opting not to release even though he can restealth back to the group as they will be able to just resin quickly here and yeah, they're probably gonna put a pile on that as we can see here resting up the rest of it uh, thankfully there was no uh, more explosive going through because uh, of course without the healer it would have been difficult for them to deal with but uh, yeah all those pulls are very difficult as we talked about it all the time just this explosive just a, dif a difficult affix for skyline d to deal with and uh, still very surprising to me that they chose to pick this map maybe they just thought that no one else is going to practice this because uh, who would be crazy enough to counter pick a, a lower chiasm with explosive but apparently method pakshav is one of those teams that actually practice this map as they're doing really well with only one death so far. And it seems Skyline D has indeed been jibated in this scenario. <laughs> Method Pogchamp using the time warp for the group, the Bloodlust. Of course, you still see a timer there because Dr. Jays is not available to him yet as he does have the ring on and will have his own Bloodlust later as he benefited from the double Bloodlust earlier in the map at uh, Opera, of course, where they used uh, their first one. Now, now that Adamant is dismounted from Midnight, once he gets to, I believe, 20%, I can't exactly remember the threshold, he will not remount Midnight once she reads his 100%, which he does here. So he will pony back up and get ready for kind of an altered phase one here where a lot of these spectral chargers will spawn at a set distance from the boss, which is why you're seeing the team kind of stick with the boss to make sure that none of the spectral chargers accidentally spawn right on top of you. And that can happen to you as a range. You can get caught like that, Nagura. Yeah, there's uh, an extra ability as well, which is a mad debuff that gets applied to all five, as we can see right here. One of the players needs to determine uh, who has the proper debuff that needs to be dispelled, so all of the five getting removed. We see on Skalandi actually one death coming out as they pulled the boss with uh, some of the trash. They do not have a battle rest, and it's their healer that died, who is uh, killing most of the explosives. As we can see, the melee is just trying to kill the explosives that are spawning all over the place as their healer is dead. They're uh, resetting the boss at this moment because they, they know they can't finish the boss without their healer. Yeah, I mean, they, you need that dispel for exactly the magic debuff that you were just talking about for Method Pog Champ right now. Method Pog Champ does resume their phase two right now on Adamant, who dismounts once again, getting ready to dip him below that threshold and make sure to finish him off before Midnight reaches that 100% health again. Upon doing so, Midnight, really not too dangerous after that, just has 100% damage taken and damage done buff, so it's really just the AoE stomp that could do a fair bit of damage. But I think in the 24 setting, as long as everyone's topped off, it should be okay. You can also just line up side to stomp, so we, sometimes we can see the tanks just uh, pulling Midnight to one of those sides, and whenever he casts the stomp, they just use the line of side, and ranged can... Uh, 
outranged as well as we see Elsaret and Musselburgh actually dropped pretty low from this dump but uh, they managed to survive and the bus should be going down at this point we also see the trash percentage difference uh, is crazy right now as Meta Pog Jump is on 74% in comparison to Scalandy on 42 so they are on the same bus fight but the trash difference especially in lower Karasan is uh, at 30% is quite a, quite a lot yeah I mean it just reiterates what you said earlier there's a ton of trash in here with not much health and as a result it really doesn't reward that much percent because a lot of it scales with the difficulty of the trash mobs that we know in these mythic plus dungeons so it looks like method pog champ will kind of do a bit of a backdoor strat here that we've seen some teams do going through this underground area which some players don't even know exists actually I, it's funny talking to some of these teams and they you know this spider area is just quite unknown to some people especially if you didn't play back when uh, karazan was the current dungeon or a raid rather back in burning crusade but they will be pulling some of these spiders and it does provide a pathway up to the hallway for maiden which will be their last boss and I assume what they're going to do is have just enough perfect amount of trash percentage to pull almost everything that needs to be pulled into Maiden's room, only 9% left, and then deal with Maiden. I believe they're going to skip a lot of that trash because it is quite difficult to deal with because it's so spread out and there's a lot of hunters that don't really like moving and they have a lot of uh, cleave damage, not really spread out damage, so it's they might just uh, skip a lot of that trash. And th this spider pull, actually, it looked really easy when they did it, but it's actually pretty difficult as the tank needs to kite those spiders immediately and no one can stay in front of the spiders because they cast a web spray they will just one shot anyone who's in front of them so we saw saps just using that sky step and getting uh, away as, as soon as he mass script them all together and of course we see a good view here of muscle bras transmog those hot short shorts based off of jack's real life wear uh, but they do move over here into the hallway leading up to maiden will likely get their 100 percent or most of it here and then you're right i think they'll try to opt to skip as much as they can with an invis pod into maiden's room because there are some quite dangerous portions of the trash regardless that they're spread out where that you could just get one shot with some of those kiss curse uh, dynamics to the trash yeah so they uh, trying to get the last percentage here uh, they can in theory pull some of the trash to the last boss but as i said it's explosive and it's dangerous so they might just choose to get the 100 percent be safe use that in this potion and uh, because it is the last boss that they have to kill, the Invis Potion is not going to cost you that much because, of course, if you use an Invis Potion, then you have a 10-minute cooldown on all your other potions, so it will cost you quite a bit of damage if you have to use it in the middle of a dungeon, but since they have to they use it at the end of the dungeon, it's not going to cost them that much. And it looks like they pull the last two sentries in the room. One of them does get controlled by Sebs, the DK, who can control and dead similar to the spirit that we saw uh, at the beginning of the dungeon. This last sentry will be their last 2% that they need. I think it'll give them 2%. If not, of course, they could just release the second one. And it will largely be used, of course, to proc some Cephas for the team, getting that extra damage. And now Maiden being the last boss they're choosing to do in here does have a Holy Bolt that you want interrupted on the tank, else they take permanent increased Holy damage for the fight. But really, the main mechanic Nagura comes here with that Consecrate. Yeah, the Consecrate uh, me, me is on one of the players that we saw, Dr. J, put it on the left side here. You can see the, the puddle on the floor. Uh, she will cast uh, Repentance at some point in the fight, and you need to have a D or you need to get some sort of damage on you to get out of that CC. Usually what players do is walk into the Consecrate to get the debuff on them. It's a ticking debuff, so once the Repentance comes out, they actually get uh, rid of it because of this uh, damaging debuff on them. There's some tricks you can do with, uh, depending on Apex, you can leave an explosive up for example let the explosive explode and then you would get out of it as well but uh uh, Elsa can easily deal with the debuff, so everyone just chooses to get the Consecrate debuff. Yeah, so you want to make sure, sometimes the tank, uh, oftentimes the tank, wants to make sure that they either pre-MS or pre-taunt before this happens, as Maiden can turn around and smack someone else in the group, something no one should ever do, but it can happen. So you, once that happens, the tank ensures that they have aggro on them. None of the other members of the group will fail, uh, fall down as a result or get hit. Uh, at this DPS pace, we're probably looking at one more Consecrate phase. It takes an extremely high key at Tyrannic to deal with any sort of threat in the room about running out of space so they should be able to comfortably clean that up it looks like just a bit more trouble for skyline d as well as they are finally cleaning up midnight and adamant fight at 20 percent just on midnight but with another death on the board yeah, one death, they don't, uh, their battle rest is going to come up any second now, but they're just so far behind at this point. Not only uh, are they uh, one boss behind, but they're also 58% behind. So uh, just... Yeah, I, I'm not sure why they picked this map. Like, they, I didn't see any special strat coming out from Skyland D here, but maybe they just thought it's, uh, it's a comfortable map. We practiced it a lot. Maybe something went wrong. Maybe uh, they... 
maybe the mindset from the first map, maybe they just hoped it to win the first map. But yeah, Method Park Champ, very convincing here. Uh, pretty flawless run as well. They only have one death. Uh, having 99% here, they're going to release this last sentry, which is about to die. And a perfect percentage, perfect run by Method Park Champ here. Yeah, just a couple of hiccups here and there on Morose. You know, they did have Muscle Bra go down, but overall, a really flawless run. And I mean, it shows, you know, they said this is one of their strong maps that they want that they want to either counterpick other teams with. And I mean, it just kind of fell right into their lap. And I mean, they just stormed the series, double full screen win. Oh my God, you're already dabbing again, man. Saw the excitement coming out on the stage. The final team to get their spot to BlizzCon. So the excitement definitely warranted, but we got to look already in the lower bracket, making a long run. You got to go a little bit further, but you get to rest easy knowing that you're going to BlizzCon. You basically took out the entire China region. How does that feel for you guys? Well, I'm sorry for the Chinese region. I really love that, guys, but we really want to win because yesterday we were two streamers slower than we should in the dungeon, so we were a bit upset, you know, but we came together as a team and we played super clean. I'm super, like, proud of my team, actually. And so excited that you dabbed. Was there any stress when you actually <laughs> did get here today? Like, were you guys saying, oh, no, like, yesterday was bad or was it a, a fresh new start? Well, yesterday we had a talk and we said, like, it's fine. We are not out of the tournament. So we have all the losers bracket doing the method way, you know. So, yeah, we are, we did it. And I'm really proud of my team because we made the mage work even in Halls of Vela against a really strong single target team. So that's why I'm really proud of. Well, my question is, did you guys even really have a chance to think past this match? Were you guys just going, okay, look, we need to be getting top four. Or are you guys now already having your sights on winning the entire tournament? Yeah, we obviously want to win the entire tournament. That's, we, that's why we practice that much. I mean, 12 hours a day. So, yeah, it will be not easy because now we have Method NA, really strong, Shells, Angels, and Gauss Shutters. But we will try our best to secure the rank one spot. All right, BlizzCon, maybe not enough for these guys. We're going to have to see if PogChamp can take the whole thing.